problems. Now, there are two scenarios about this. One says that this is an empowering, emancipatory thing, that you could see all of these things, and we are now seeing and knowing much more about what actually goes on. And there's another, much more pessimistic uh, scenario, which is semi-Orwellian, saying that this is actually an extremely good way, this image war, to, to manipulate people on a much wider uh, scale. How do you see the dynamics of this image? Thing? Well, it, it is, I mean, the, from the beginning, say, with the concept of embedded journalism, it was just a you know, this demonstration of extreme corruption of the media. I mean, no honest journalist would ever agree to be embedded in a military unit. I mean, that's saying I'm not going to be a journalist. I mean, if you're living and uh, you know, spending your time with a marine battalion, you're going to see life from their point of view. You can't help it. I mean, just ordinary comradeship or you know, sharing of experiences or coming under fire or whatever it may be. You're going to be reporting the war the way the marine battalion wants to see the war. Uh, so the concept of embedded journalists is so grotesque. Can't talk about it. Actually, many of the journalists, I don't know how many, but a lot of journalists just refused. Some of them happened to be personal friends. Uh, one of the top Middle East, car the major Middle East correspondent for one of the major television channels, is an old personal friend. And he refused to be embedded. He just traveled by himself. And they just didn't run his reports uh, because he wasn't embedded. So he was telling what it looked like from some other point of view. Uh, so, uh, so on the one hand, there's been a tremendous effort to control the picture. On the other hand, it isn't easy to do. I mean, there's too many sources of news and information now. So if people are you know, energetic enough, they can turn on Al Jazeera and get a different picture. That's one of the reasons why the U.S. Just keeps trying to shut it down. Uh, I mean, there's a very almost comical struggle going on between the United States and Qatar. You know, Qatar is a dictatorship. The United States is supposed to be a democracy. The United States is trying to force Qatar to shut down Al Jazeera. And the emir of Qatar is probably having fun, but he gives press conferences in Washington, and, which nobody ever reports, but they're kind of very funny. He gets them, in which he lectures the American media on freedom of the press. He says, well, you know, there's this <laughs> concept of freedom of the press, which we believe in, and so we're going to let it go. And meanwhile, Colin Powell's trying to get him to shut it down. Uh, but it's just too hard. Uh, in fact, the U.S. keeps bombing their headquarters. Um, they bombed their headquarters in Kabul uh, just before the U.S. You know, Northern Alliance came in. So they wouldn't report, and they did the same in Iraq, and they kicked them out of Fallujah, and so on and so forth. But you just can't control it anymore. There are just too many sources of information, and some, when something leaks out and becomes prominent, and you don't say anything about it, you've lost any hope of being taken seriously. So things do get through. That's how the torture stories came about. Uh, so on the one hand, there is a and there are plenty of journalists who do have professional integrity. I mean, even the ones who are embedded. You know, they're not completely controlled. A lot of them really take the job seriously. Uh, so things, it's a very hard system to completely control. What you can control is the ideological framework, because that comes from the editorial offices and from the intellectual classes. And they are extremely disciplined. So you just don't get any questioning on things like, say, bringing democracy. I mean, that's, you know, like, uh, um, it would be like an um, Iranian journalist saying, you know, I don't believe in God or something. Or, a, <laughs> you know, a Communist Party journalist saying, I don't believe in Marx or something. Now, there's some things you just can't do. Like, questioning authority is just out. You know. But that's part of the intellectual culture generally. It's not just the media. Uh, on the other hand, describing what's happening in front of your eyes, that's a lot harder to control, even if you're embedded. So there's a, you know, there's very strict ideological control, but uh, plenty of information leaking out. Uh, and that's you know, an inherent problem that uh, uh, even the best controlled media can't, can't stop. I mean, take, say, the Russians during the uh, pre-Gorbachev, pre you know, before the beginning of opening up, 
if you look back at the uh, uh, Russian, uh, you, I mean, some of you are old enough, you may remember how it was reported here, but uh, I looked at the uh, Russian journals in the early 80s to see how they're reporting the Afghan war. And they were reporting it pretty critically. I mean, this is under strict communist rule. But the Communist Party was sharply condemning the media because they were unpatriotic. Like they would show pictures of, uh, you know, Russian uh, soldiers being uh, in miserable conditions and everybody hates them and so on and so forth. And that wasn't the official picture you're supposed to present. It's supposed to be a picture of liberation. But it was getting into the Kremlin-controlled media to the extent that there were protests about it from the party hierarchy. I, you can tell me about your own experience, but I'll bet you it was true of the uh, media here during that period, too. It's just very hard to avoid. Uh, and in a freer country, of course, it's even harder to avoid. So you, I think the general picture is uh, ideological conformity, but uh, uh, leakage concerning information and facts. Uh, I should say that in the United States, this has been very carefully studied. Uh, one of the good things about the United States, as distinct from Europe, uh, is that uh, intellectuals tend to be more critical. Uh, European intellectuals think of themselves as very critical and adversarial and so on. Uh, but in fact, there's almost no self-criticism in Europe. I mean, they, uh, one sign of it is there's very little media critique. So if you take a look at Germany or France and so on, there's virtually nothing is done on critical analysis of the media. And the reason is because of illusions that are widely held among intellectuals about how independent they are. So there's nothing to study. Well, you know, start studying it, you quickly find the opposite. Uh, but in the United States, where there happens to be a more critical attitude, there is a lot of media critique. And uh, people's beliefs, say about Iran, uh, lots of things, uh, are studied and correlated with their media sources. So we have a huge amount of information about people's beliefs and where they're getting their beliefs from. And it's quite, it's quite, it's quite illuminating. Uh, it, it, I mean, it turns out that Americans are off the international spectrum in their beliefs about Iraq. So if, even today, a large number, probably close to half, uh, believe that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and that weapon, uh, they, that, uh, you know, Iraq was tied with Al-Qaeda and it was involved in 9-11 and so on. Those beliefs were very high before the war. I mean, it's kind of hard to maintain them now, but they're still quite high. In fact, a large, very large percentage of Americans believe that uh, um, the, world's, the world population supported the war. And I mean, like you could hardly find a country in the world where there was 10% support. But people don't know that. They believe the world supported us, uh, you know, that uh, there were weapons of mass destruction, they're involved in... In fact, part of the reason for the terror, the, the, the violence in the prisons, I mean, you have to really understand the people involved in it. The people carrying out the violence in the prisons are trained to believe that the people who they're torturing are the people who uh, attacked the United States on September 11th. We're getting, we're getting revenge. You know, look what they did to us, now we're going to do it to them. You know? That's the attitude that's ingrained in people, uh, particularly in soldiers, where you can indoctrinate them more effectively. But it's a large part of the population. And I think that's the source of the, uh, you know, the general culture of uh, terror and torture in the prisons. Uh, but th those beliefs are still held. And they have, and of course, as you would expect, having those beliefs and supporting the war are very closely correlated, which is sensible. And if you have those beliefs, it makes sense to support the war. Uh, but, uh, uh, and they've also been traced to news sources. So it turns out, I don't know, those of you who know the United States, uh, one of the pop popular television channels is called Fox News, very right-wing channel, which plenty of people watch, uh, maybe a majority, uh, or plurality at least. But uh, the people who get their news from Fox News I mean, about 80% of them have some totally crazed belief, you know, which nobody in the world has. Uh, and it sort of goes down. People are getting their news from um, the New York Times, you know, the mainstream uh, 
elite press, about 50% have some crazy belief. Uh, those of who are getting it from uh, National Public Radio, which is considered the independent intellectuals channel, about 25% have crazy beliefs that nobody in the world has. Uh, and this is excluding another part of the population uh, which doesn't use any of these news sources. Uh, and this is kind of interesting. I mean, about over 20% of the population in the United States is getting their news from talk radio. Now, if any of you have been in the United States and listened to talk radio, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, from the ninth, part of the effort to re break down the 60s dissidents was a major effort on the part of the right-wing foundations to buy up radio, because a lot of people listened to it. And they were able to take a, the talk radio, I don't know if you have this here, but there's this, you know, you have a person running the radio program, people call in and they talk up and back and so on. Uh, the people who run it are so, you, know, you can't even call them right-wing, they're in a different universe. I mean, there's just nobody like them in the universe. Uh, but uh, they run talk radio, and that is the source of news for about 20% of the population. If you look at younger people, people from, say, 18 to 25, uh, where most of them are getting their news are from uh, late-night television programs, comedy programs, uh, where you have, uh, you know, after the main channel primetime television news is over from, say, 11 o'clock on, uh, there are these programs with uh, you know, talk show, uh, you know, sort of com kind of comedy. I don't know how you describe it. Uh, if any of you have seen it, you know what I mean. But there's a little bit of information scattered around it. Uh, that's one of the main sources of news for younger people. Uh, so uh, the uh, media is a complicated story, but a lot is known about it. Uh, on the other hand, by now there are plenty of alternative media. So lots of people are just getting their information from the internet, or from activist groups, or uh, other sources, and they have a very different picture of the world. And that you just can't control. And that's, this, that's right at the core of the social movements. I mean, all of the social movements, they're organizing and their interaction and so on, is internet-based by now. <laughs>